So I know that there are different people over here that come in from different discipline. So I will try, I don't understand much about dissociation. All I understand a little bit about is physiology. And what I will try to do in the time that we have together to give you our perspective on the physiology of the brain, how we try to tackle it, and then you will bring on your perspective, we will bring our perspective, and together we can generate something that is better than one plus one. That's what I'm hoping that will happen. So this is how it starts. Okay. If we are looking over here, this is the universe. It's huge. Okay. When we are speaking about the universe, we can all say that the chance that we will really understand what's going on is relatively low. And this is a single neuron in the brain. Look at the similarity. And by tackling that and by looking at that, the first thing that you need to be is to be modest. So this is behind my leg. This is above my leg. Okay. So how, how can I do something with something that is such a huge thing, such a challenge? You need to simplify it. And when we need to simplify things, oops, sorry for that, is how can we simplify such a complex neurological system? So different scientists across the world are focusing on one aspect of what's happening in the brain. There will be people that will focus on the blood vessels. There will be people who will focus on the neuron, on glia cells, on the chemical part that happened between the synapses. And everybody thinks that he will find the solution because this is his world and saying, oh, now I understand everything. But what we are looking, since we understand that this is a huge universe and it's very challenging to understand it, we are looking only for the switch. We are looking for a limiting factor for the bottleneck that if we will open it, a lot of things may happen. We don't understand exactly what, but a lot of things will happen. We only need to open a physiological barrier. That's what we need to do. And if we need to simplify it more, you can look over here on a wound that happens across the tissue in our body. And on the left side, you can see the brain. You can see that there are many similarities. It's actually almost the same. The same thing that we need for a peripheral wound care or wound healing, we need also for the wounds that we see in the brain. In the periphery, we will call the cell fibroblast. And in the brain, we will call it glia cells. But the general perspective is the same. The general, the basic needs are the same in order to enable wound healing. <laughs> to simplify it more, and I'm sorry for this figure, you can look at the wound over here. You can see a wound, you can see an aquatic tissue, and we understand quite clearly that what we need in order to cure that wound is perfusion, blood flow, oxygenation, and stem cells. And this is an aquatic tissue. On this side, we can see the same wound, an aquatic tissue. And what we will need for this wound, it's the same element, oxygenation, stem cells, and blood flow. What is the main difference between that wound and that wound? This wound, we see. We understand what we are dealing with. We smell it. We see the target in front of us. This is high tech. We're looking at an MRI, at CT, we're speaking about the brain in a mystic fashion. Cognitive, personality, dissociation, art, it's a tissue. It's a tissue that can get wound. And our major goal is to simplify it. So what do we need in order to enable this wound repair? We need basic things. We need oxygen, because without oxygen, nothing happened. You can block the oxygen to supply to the hand and 
you can see what will happen to the hand. We need a trigger. Every regenerative process needs a trigger. Our body, our physiology is very lazy. We will not do anything unless there is a demand. Okay? And we need stem cells, and we will speak about it. And in order to simplify things, we will speak one by one. We will keep the association to the end, once the basics are clear to us. Start with the oxygenation. The brain is very unique tissue. When we are looking at the oxygenation at the brain, at each time point in the different part of the brain, the brain lives under epoxy condition. Or not epoxic, oxygen limited condition. And you can see what happened in the different part of the brain, and you can see what happened when we have an injury. It's significantly worse. We feel it on the daily routine. How do we see it under normal physiology? The classical example is this, okay? When we need to do multitasking. If I'm driving the car and I'm speaking on the cellular phone, I will miss the turn. Why is that? Because the blood flow is going to a certain location when I'm speaking now, on the expense of the other part that is responsible for my navigation. And I'm missing the turn. Okay, that's multitasking, it's very hard. And we need to challenge that. And we were challenging whether oxygen is a rate limiting factor for brain recovery, or even under normal condition. In order to play with the oxygen, we have this. This is the hyperbaric oxygen that we are doing. It's actually, we are utilizing it in order to play with the oxygen level in the blood as much as we want. We can increase it, we can decrease it. For somebody who enjoys physiology like me, this is an excellent playground, okay? The best, and I get paid for that, which is even better. <laughs> On Wednesday, you will come over here so you can see it. But actually, if we are taking these blood vessels and put it in a hyperoxygenized condition, you can see that what we are changing is the dissolved oxygen, the amount of oxygen that is finally delivered to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the organ within the cell that is responsible for generation of energy. So we have the privilege to work on the mitochondria itself. We are playing with the mitochondria. Here we challenge it. We took healthy individual, we put them in the chamber, and we want to evaluate whether oxygen is a limiting factor under normal condition. We ask the people to do multitasking, increasing the oxygen, and surprise, surprise, you can see that any complex motor cognitive demand that we have is much better under hyperoxy condition. How do you use that? It's very exciting because you can take a pilot, put him in hyperoxygenized environment, he will perform better, okay? So we spoke about the oxygen. The other things that we need is trigger. We need to trigger regenerative process. What is the most powerful trigger that we have in our body in order to generate the initiation of regeneration is hypoxia, lack of oxygen. If there is hypoxia, there is a signal that go up that tell you, you have a damage, start to regenerate now. So we can take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, we will have the trigger. The only thing that is missing is that it's not healthy, okay? You can kill the person. So we thought what we should do. What the body actually sense is not absolute values, is delta, it changes. Okay? Even us in our daily life, we will feel that we are rich or poor, not based on the absolute value that we have, based on the neighbor. Okay? If I have more than him, I will feel that I'm very fortunate. If I have less, I'm feeling that I have, but I can get more. Same over here. We are taking the person, increasing the oxygen to very high level, and then taking him back to normal taking only the mask of hyperoxy condition. And that can be a trigger for a lot of things. The most significant trigger that happened during hypoxia is HIF, hypoxic induced factor. It is a transcriptor factor, meaning it's something that if it's going up, he will affect a lot of gene expression. 
angiogenesis, generation of new blood vessels, stem cells, okay, etc., etc., erythropoietin, and more and more. So this is what it is. We can play with it on the cellular level, causing hyperoxia going down and up. We can see the increase in HIF. We can see it also in the brain tissue. And we can see it also in a very important thing, which is the stem cells. Stem cells, you know, are unique cells that can differentiate into different tissue. Actually, I was generated from two stem cells that came together. And from this tissue, all the organs happen. Whoever created us, in order to give us repairs, gave us a three-dimensional printer so we can print what is missing. These are the stem cells. We have it in the bone marrow, but not only there. We have it in other parts of our body. And we want to trigger that. And we are triggering by what we call the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. By hyperoxia, we are generating the things that happen during hypoxia, including stem cells. And you can see over here, people that are coming to the treatment, and by repeated treatment, we can see how we can increase the stem cells in the blood. This is on real people that are coming to the treatment. We can see hematopoietic stem cells, and you can see mesenchymal stem cells. These are the cells that we have in the tissue. And the same thing happens in the brain. The generation of the neuronal stem cells, the stimulation of them. And we can see amazing things. Okay, we can see if we are looking directly on a brain tissue, what you see over here, this is an mice model. You can see generation of neurons, which is unbelievable because I was taught in medical school that neuron cannot regenerate. Surprise, surprise, it can, okay? And we understand it more and more today that it is feasible. We can see it on rats and mice, and we can see it on with a specific MRI technology, which call it DTI MRI. We can see the actual nerve fibers, and we can see it over here. This is before treatment, after treatment. So neurogenesis can happen and can be induced. If we want to simulate what we understand today is in order to evaluate the brain, we are doing combination of metabolic imaging, how the metabolism in the brain is ongoing, together with anatomical imaging. It's a SPECT scan together with anatomical that can be either MRI or CT. In order to simplify things for people who are not very smart like me, okay, we need to simplify it. We are using colors. This is a combination of metabolic and anatomical imaging. The blue is a necrotic tissue, fully dead tissue. There is nothing over there. The blue stays the same. Surrounding the necrotic tissue, there is a tissue. We mark it as green, that if we will bring the stem cell, the angiogenesis, will rejuvenate. And you can see that. This is a post-stroke in order to simplify it. Remember the hand. OK, we'll get to that. This is another example, a part that is responsible for motor function. Before treatment, after treatment, the hand doesn't move like this. As the previous example, the hand will move. Broca, speaking capabilities, before treatment, after treatment, because it's a non-necrotic tissue. So how, how we find ourselves suddenly in dissociation? <laughs> in the journey that we went in. If you will come to me 10 years ago, you will tell me you will deal with dissociation, I will tell you, no way. This is not by my part of the deal, this is my wife part of the deal, who is a social worker. And also, I'm not sure that dissociation that will be the main goal of her. Okay, so the journey started with a disease or a syndrome we call fibromyalgia. In order to explain what is fibromyalgia, you can just look at the picture drawn by Frida Kahlo, who had fibromyalgia, which is, you look at it, you understand what's going on. You can see this is her. It's a self-drawing of her. And this is also her. This is also a self-drawing of, of Frida. 
you can see the pain that is felt all over her body with a certain area that are more painful than the rest. Today we understand that the main problem in fibromyalgia is not at the location where you feel the pain. The main problem in fibromyalgia is in the brain, in the part of the brain that are responsible for the pain interpretation. Okay, there is a signal that goes out of the brain, but the signal is misinterpreted. Okay, the pain is a good thing that we feel pain. If I'm feeling pain, it means that there is a danger and I need to take my, my hand off. But if there is a pain without a problem, it's like a false alarm. So these people are living in continuous false alarm condition. They feel the alarm, they, they hear the alarm, but there is no war going on. And that's a problem, but it's a real biological problem because the problem is in the brain. And in the first study that we done, we took people with fibromyalgia. We didn't did any deviation of the cause of the fibromyalgia, just fibromyalgia patient. We took them into the treatment. It was this study. People were randomized either to treatment, control, brain evaluation before, after, all the pain evaluation, etc., etc. The results were very good, meaning more than 70% of the patient didn't have fibromyalgia by definition at the end, based on the way we evaluate fibromyalgia. And a lot of good things happen. One of the things we are able to map today, the brain areas that are responsible for the pain interpretation. Because if you have a patient with fibromyalgia and three months afterwards without fibromyalgia and you have the brain imaging, you can start to do correlation and learn which part was changed in correlation to what you see in the clinic. But surprisingly in this study, and this is part, and we'll get to that later on, surprisingly, we had quite significant amount of patients, and this study was only for females. Female was part of the inclusion criteria that had worsening of the symptoms of fibromyalgia during the first 20 to 30 session of treatment. And we didn't understand that. And more surprisingly, we had people who came into the study who suddenly have recovery of repressed memories. Years from the past that they were not familiar that happened to them came up. Unbelievable for somebody like me. Okay, it was shocking to me. I did in my pants. I was crazy. I had dissociation myself. I said, I don't want to deal with that. Okay. <laughs> Terrible thing. Okay, I said, oh, shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can say it in English. <laughs> okay, but I, I have a problem. I, my belief is, if you have a chance to do something good, and you're not doing it, it's like you are doing something bad, and the universe will hit you. <laughs> and I don't want to be punished by the universe. I'm very afraid of that. I said, okay, oh shit, but now we have to deal with that. Luckily, I have Rachel. I had Rachel at this time. When I'm doing, she hold my hand, said, shy, don't be afraid. I'm with you, let's move forward. And by the way, the repressed memory that recovered, we confirmed them. We make sure that it was indeed the true story. And we have something like 10, in this study we have 10 people like that. And we try to think about it. And my perspective that I will present to you is pure biological, because I don't understand anything about psychology. Uh, I, at least I don't think, okay? And this is how I see it. And I must tell you that the way we look at it now is that child 
sexual abuse is probably quite different than PTSD that happened during war. And this opened a Pandora box, and now we have a study also on PTSD. It's an ongoing study, but this is a different issue. Maybe on Wednesday when you're coming to our center, if you're interested, maybe Karen can speak with you about PTSD and the study that, that is ongoing. But with regard to child sexual abuse, as you all know, usually it's not a single event. It's a repeated event. And when you are speaking about dissociation, people who coming from physiology as me said, okay, so what, what does it mean? What will happen in the brain? In order to activate the brain tissue, we are controlling the activation of different parts of the brain by blood flow. That's what we are doing. If I want to move my hand, there will be increased blood flow to the part that is responsible to the hand movement. My leg, my leg, okay? My coordination, more to the cerebellum. We see it in functional MRI, okay? We ask the person in functional MRI to do something, he's doing it, we see the difference in blood flow to certain location, and we say, okay, this part is responsible for the hand movement. Okay, this part is responsible to this way of thinking. So if we are speaking about dissociation, disconnecting part of the brain that we don't want him to be active at the moment, we don't want our present at the moment, we don't want the part in the brain that is responsible, that sense our present at the moment, I will take the blood flow from there to different area. By the way, in children, the ability to do differentiation in blood flow is significantly, 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 and you can say that a couple of times more than adults. So by doing that, we are reducing the blood flow to a certain areas that we will get to that later on. If there is a decreased amount of blood flow to this area, the area is injured. This area is injured. And it's not different than reducing blood flow during stroke to this area. It's the same thing. The only difference is that usually we cannot kill ourselves by only thinking. So this area will probably will not go into necrosis, anatomical lack missing part, but it will go into metabolic dysfunction tissue. It will not function metabolically. It will not function metabolically. Whoop. The hand will go on this part. So now we are dealing with something that is completely different. We have a metabolic dysfunction tissue. We have a biological limitation. And we need to deal with that biological limitation. And dealing with the major biological limitation, like the wound in the brain, in the leg, it's not enough to speak with him. We need something more. We need to add something on it. We need something biological that will change the basic of what we are doing. And then we have a better ground to take this person out. It's like somebody has broken his hand or leg, okay? We can teach him how to jump on one leg. We can teach him how to go with a stick. But don't you want to use a cast, fix the broken leg, and then teach him how to walk? It will be easier. I don't have time, okay. So what we are doing actually with the hyperbaric, we are changing this baseline. And because we are changing this baseline, it's uncontrolled being activated. And then this person have recovery of the repressed memory without doing nothing. It's coming up because this area is currently active again. It's active. The hand will go like this and the memory will come up, but now in a very controlled environment that then can take him to the next level of, of performance. Okay, that's the missing link that we are missing today because people from different perspectives usually don't speak with each other. Okay, you will speak with psychology, I will speak with physiology, but now finally we are sitting together in the same room, which is very important.
Yeah. Yeah. And now we can see it. And now we can see it. So in the study we have done on fibromyalgia that was finished not long ago, we took patients that have fibromyalgia and the trigger for the fibromyalgia was sexual childhood, abu childhood sexual abuse. That was the trigger. We took patients only from this territory. And the results are very good. You can read the article. But what is important, we see the changes in, we see the wounds in the brain. We can actually diagnose the problem in the brain. And if I need to give you some perspective, because I don't have much time, the area in the brain who is probably the most important part in the CSA and the repressed memory is the prefrontal cortex. And we see the changes over there. If the repressed memory is going up, a lot of the symptoms that related to it, we see activity in the prefrontal cortex, which was already recognized by other studies. But here we have the privilege to have people with a full brain imaging with or without the, the repressed memory that is coming up. There are some other parts that are also very important, and we see the change because, of course, as you know from your clinic, not all dissociative patients are the same, and not all wounds are the same. Depends which part of the brain are involved currently in this patient category, in this brain in the wound. But what we can do is we can now figure out a better way. We have a new windows. We start to see new things. The technology of how we are doing the brain imaging had significantly advanced. Okay? Our way of communication was significantly advanced. People like me who didn't learn what you learn, I can read it. Okay? It's approachable by me. In the past, I needed to go to the library and look for textbook and look for articles or whatever it is. Today, I can sit at home, I can read, I can learn. You can read what I'm doing. And then we can find ourselves in the same room over here, sitting, discussing, and trying to build up something new together. So I will stop over here because I don't have enough time. But those of you who will come on Wednesday, we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much.